This video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you wish to learn more about developing your own website and taking your business to the next level, then stay tuned for more details. Welcome back to my retrospective on the 2003 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Today we'll be discussing the aftermath of Season 1 and focusing on Season 2. In the previous video I discussed the history of the TMNT that led to the 2003 series, how the first season of the 2003 series rebuilt the brand from the ground up, introducing it to a new generation by adapting the original comic storyline and why it was so effective. I closed last week by saying that before the first season had even aired its final episode it had already gotten renewed for a second season. The show was popular, to the point where it was even used to promote other shows on 4Kids. Now, what about the first season of the 2003 series allowed it to stick? Well, like I said at the beginning of the last video, it was a full budget modernization with great action and a storyline. By the end of the season, you care about the characters and wonder what's going to happen to them next in their various adventures, taking the time to develop the characters and their relationships. But I would certainly be lying if I said that was the only reason why the show was so successful. One of the reasons why the original Turtles cartoon ran for almost 10 years was because of its ability to generate profit via merchandise, which was no different for the 2003 series. It's cool that for this new generation of Turtles, they got the same companies to do new versions of old things. For example, Playmates Toys was still the company responsible for the action figures, and they're still the ones making TMNT figures to this day. A buy I'm pretty proud of from earlier this year would be mint in box versions of the Turtle figures from this era, which hang proudly on my wall. This line of action figures had a greater amount of detail in the characters and accessories than they ever did in the 90s, and you can tell that just by looking at these guys in the box, because I won't dare open them. I mean, this packaging looks incredible. Although I've always wondered why the figures were off-model when they had the budget for fully detailed accessories. For example, the weapons the Turtles use are clad in brown or white straps when in the show it matches the various mask colors, or how Shredder is blue when he's gray in the show. Doing research for this video series has led to the discovery that the art design changed a lot when this show was being developed, seen here in this artwork. It shows the figures actually were being accurate to an earlier version of the artwork. Not that it's out of the ordinary for the art design to evolve in the developmental stage, it's just that I think it's interesting that the figures were based on those designs. Blue Shredder even made it as far as the official renders that got used on DVDs and video game boxes. Speaking of games, this was also important. Konami published all the classic TMNT games for the arcades and home consoles of the 80s and 90s. For the PS2, Xbox, GameCube, and PC, they published a bunch of games to tie into the 4Kids series. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1, Turtles 2, Battle Nexus, and Turtles 3, Mutant Nightmare. The first game was based on the first season of the show from Things Change all the way to Return to New York. This game had you pick your turtle and battle through various stages. It was arcade-like in its setup. When I was younger, I didn't really like this game. I've never even finished it because it always kicked my ass, but still, a nice throwback to an older generation of game. Battle Nexus was based on the second season, only starting with a Return to New York stage and a Search for Splinter stage of the TCRI building, and then going into the story of Season 2 with the Turtles in Space, the Secret Origins arc, and the thing the game is titled after, the Battle Nexus, which we'll get into before the video's over. This game has one campaign where you switch between Turtles at will with some unlockable characters in addition to that. I like that, but the variety in the combat and the fluidity in the animation was definitely a downgrade from the first game. Mutant Nightmare obviously being based on Season 3 with the Space Invaders, Worlds Collide, Exodus, and Ultimate Draco arcs. This game is you pick a turtle like the first game, but AIs control the other turtles as other players can drop in and play as well. This being the only one of these games I actually beat as a kid, but I chalked that up to my using the invincibility cheat. All three games do use footage from the show when applicable even though it's always crusty whenever they do. But there are also new scenes, the first two games creating new cutscenes based on the show's art style, although you can certainly see the budget being lower just by looking at it. What I found interesting about these new scenes was the dialogue being a lot more wooden and obvious, I guess. Take this part from Battle Nexus, where we get the same setup from Return to New York. In the episode, Leo notes the foot goons waiting for orders, and Shredder says, Astute as usual, Leonardo. But then, in the game, he says, Always the smart one. Leonardo. That sort of thing. Mutant Nightmare having its own CG cutscenes, and, uh, Nightmare is right. In addition to the main trilogy, Konami also published handheld games based on the console ones, the GBA receiving Turtles 1 and Battle Nexus, and the DS getting Mutant Nightmare. The console trilogy translated the arcade style faithfully into 3D, but by that point, devs had already realized that 3D beat-em-ups weren't really worth doing when games as great as Devil May Cry redefined 3D combat action. So the 3D TMNT games look inferior by comparison, but then you get the 2D games where the arcade setup and more basic combat is put to better use, so some might enjoy these more. These aren't games, but the GBA also received episodes of the show as a part of the GBA video lineup, and... Oh my god. I suppose at the intended resolution, it's pretty impressive, but a dated product of its time now. Last but not least is TMNT Mutant Melee, which functions pretty much how you'd expect. You run around arenas as your favorite characters and beat the crap out of each other. 
It didn't play much of this one as I didn't grow up with it, so all I can really do is laugh at the terrible character models. Look at Leo here, he's got a real case of the Smash Bros 64 hands. This game includes a history segment on the TMNT in the options menu, and I thought this was a very interesting read, including all kinds of information about the Mirage Comics development that I had not heard before. But that's just the thing. It was exclusively about the comic series. I kept waiting for the history lesson on the Fred Wolf series, but it's just treated as a footnote in the history of the brand, which I thought was weird because that is the version that even allowed this one to exist in the first place. That's part of why I said one of the goals for this show was to leave the original behind. The 2003 series itself doesn't really pay much homage to the original show outside of mythology gags like this part where April wears yellow in season two. What's with the getup? You a news reporter? <laughs> in another lifetime, maybe. This revival set out to make this the new face of the brand and not rely on the original series. To that end, I think they were pretty successful, but this did cause a split in the fan base as some people preferred the new direction and some fans of the original show felt alienated by what the 2003 series had done in its first season alone. These days, from what I can see, the TMNT fan base seems to get along on the basis of them all being Turtle fans, but from what I gather, it wasn't always that way. Having said all that, I think the stage is pretty set for my discussion of Season 2. I can only imagine that if hardcore fans of the old version felt alienated by Season 1, that feeling could only get worse from here. But before we get into that, we need to talk about the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace. If you're a creative type who has work to show off to the world, whether it be art, music, or video making like I do, having a well-designed website is a pretty critical part of the process. Squarespace offers users an incredibly simple to understand way of building their own website. What makes it so easy to use is the fact that they offer a plethora of different template websites to build yours off of, as you can click a few options that best describe your website's goals and they'll give you the templates that work best, or you can just start from scratch. Either way, you have plenty of options to work with, including dozens of different fonts, plenty of color schemes you can pick, there are just so many ways to customize the look and feel to make your website unique to you. And there's an option to embed links to other websites, such as your other social media accounts, which would be crucial for someone who works on YouTube, for example. Squarespace's website builder is free to use, so you can get all the details just right before you launch. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash jaysreviews for a 10% discount on your first purchase. If what you're seeing on screen looks useful and might finally get you to pull the trigger on that project that's been on your mind, go ahead and scroll down to the pinned comment to get started now. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. With all that said, let's get back to the show. To provide a brief recap, at the end of Season 1, Master Splinter was taken by the Guardians to help the Turtles defeat Shredder and return to New York. Little did the Turtles know, Shredder somehow managed to walk off, being decapitated. In the Search for Splinter episodes, the Turtles find him at the TCRI building that is populated by slimy aliens that back the Turtles onto a teleportation device that warps them halfway across the universe. Which is where Season 2 picks up in the Turtles in Space arc. Five whole episodes dedicated to the Turtles' adventure in another galaxy. We begin on the planet Dahunib as a silver robot's being chased by the military unit. The planet is run by the Federation, led by General Blank. They're chasing the robot, known as the Fugitoid, for a currently unknown reason as the Turtles materialize in the midst of the Fugitoid being cornered. The Turtles align themselves with the Fugitoid and learn that he was once a scientist named Professor Honeycutt that was building a device called the Teleportal, and the General wanted to use it for his war against the Triceraton Republic. Honeycutt wouldn't build it under these circumstances, but one day, an accident caused Honeycutt's mind to be transferred into one of his robotic assistants, and since robots have no rights, Honeycutt as a robot can now be forced to build the teleportal and decided to run, this being when the Turtles showed up. Similar to Season 1, I really like how the Turtles just show up in the middle of a story that was already unfolding without them. It's convincing world building. The Turtles believe that the teleportal is their path back home, so helping the Fugitoid is their prime mission. I was kind of dreading the five Turtles in Space episodes because I remember them being pretty boring, but I was pleasantly surprised upon doing this revisit to the series. Like I said, the Turtles in Space is a five episode arc and they really do a good job keeping it fresh. Episode one sees the Turtles land on Dahunib, meet Honeycutt, learn his backstory, help him evade the Federation, introducing the audience to them, the Triceratons who also want the teleportal, and set up the fact that the Turtles are going to have to build the teleportal to get home. That's a big agenda for one episode, but they squeeze it all in and have room for multiple action set pieces. Episode 2 focuses on the Turtles trying to get off-world, which results in the Triceratons capturing the Fugitoid as we see a battle in a bar between the two warring factions. The Turtles chasing the Triceratons in a left-behind vehicle, and there not being any oxygen in the ship they sneak onto. That element of Return to New York where they maximize the drama and suspense of every situation is still in place for Season 2, as Episode 3 sees the Turtles in the Triceraton jail dealing with the change in atmosphere from oxygen to sulfur. Then trying to create a scheme to escape, but getting sent to the games in Episode 4, a gladiator arena where uncooperative prisoners are tossed in to fight for their lives. One of them being Traximus, a Triceraton that fought against the corrupt Prime Leader Xanramon, but found himself trapped here because of that. 
Episode 5 is about the Turtles escaping with the Fugitoid and having to buy time with the Warring Sides while the Teleportal is being built. That recap served to explain my point that these five episodes keep the variety really high as you don't know what direction the story is going to take next. While they still make time for good character moments like the Turtles winning the approval of the prisoners in the games, or when the Federation and Triceratrons begin to close in as the first test of the Teleportal fails, Honeycutt wanting Leonardo to destroy him to erase any knowledge of how to build the Teleportal from the galaxy. But Leo doesn't have it in him to do it. And that is when the signal from the Teleportal is picked up and the group is saved. To be continued. The story directly picks up in the next episode, but that's technically a part of a separate arc, so I'll just judge this story as a five-part saga. I think they did a great job with it. All the action set pieces are great, getting you back into the show after the first season, and they pulled off this much different setting really well. As the reverence the creators of the show have for science fiction is made pretty clear. I was thinking going into this, that following up upon the Turtles' origin story is pretty much a blank canvas. Most people know the Turtles for their street-level battles with Shredder, Season 2 of the classic series and the second Turtles film did more with that same status quo, but the Turtles universe is very supernatural and cosmic in nature, something the classic series and movie series later got into. It's just, like I said, that part of it isn't what most people would think of when the brand is brought up. Season 2 of the 2003 series just diving into said cosmic side of the mythos a hesitation and making that bridge not feel awkward is a job well done. Season 1 already kind of dropped hints that this world is a mysterious one with episodes like The King, or the fact that aliens are hiding on Earth as seen in The Search for Splinter. Come to think of it, I think that was an intentional element when they did this story. You get surprised by the alien reveal at the end of Season 1, but then you spend 5 episodes on Dahunib and the Triceraton homeworld learning about this backstory and these new characters that you almost forget what was happening back on Earth. The start of the next episode, Secret Origins Part 1 planting us face first back in reality as the opening stinger is a news show describing the aftermath of the search for Splinter, as the Turtles getting blasted to another galaxy and back 8 hours later on the transmat drew all kinds of attention to the TCRI building that they didn't have before as the military is trying to get in. At the transmat room, Mr. Mortu picked up the signal from the teleportal and got the Turtles back to Earth. But the writers again pull off effective drama maxing by having some of the Federation troops and Triceratons arrive in the beam as well, with the Earth aliens having to beam them back to where they came from. Setting up a future storyline as one of the Triceratons escapes into New York's sewer system. But when that's done, we can focus on the story of the Secret Origins arc. Not to be confused with the opening of Justice League that goes by the same name. I just said I went into these recordings expecting to be bored by the Turtles in Space arc, but have that be made up for with the Secret Origins arc. However, by the end, I felt the exact opposite about these two. To best talk about this episode, I think it's important to outline what happens in it, as I think these three episodes' main purpose is exposition, so let us begin. The Turtles are finally reunited with Master Splinter, who explains that the aliens called the Utrams are not their enemies, and in fact, their stories are very much connected. Mr. Mortu takes the Turtles, Splinter, and Honeycutt to a pod machine that gives the heroes a virtual reality version of the history of the Utrams landing on Earth, which goes back 1,000 years as Mortu's ship was carrying the most ruthless criminal the galaxy has ever known, an Utram named Shirel, who has a suspiciously familiar voice. I will escape, and you will all perish. That is my promise. Shirel escapes and causes the ship to crash land on an uncharted planet nearby, Earth. They land in feudal Japan and realize that the technology of this planet is just not advanced enough to rebuild the ship, and they'll have to wait until Earth does have the technology to bring them home. The technology they did salvage from the crash allowed them to build exosuits they could use to disguise themselves as humans for the 1,000 years it took to achieve their goal of going home. However, Chirel also survived the crash and steals one of the exosuits. Very soon after, the Utrams are attacked by an ancient ancestor of the Shredder and his Foot Clan. Part 1 ending on the note of the pods being hacked by Baxter Stockman plunging the turtles inside the virtual reality projection as if it were real, as Leo witnesses the ancient Shredder craft the story of Tangu where we see that being an over-the-top asshole runs in the Shredder family. And now for your payment. The Utrams establish the Guardian unit to protect themselves from the foot. The Utrams give the Turtles a failsafe they can use to escape the game. Well, I guess you'd call it a game. It's not really, but I don't have anything else to describe it as. When they do, it turns out that the Shredder is here to destroy the Utrams, clearly being more adept with Utram security than the military as he made it inside the building, setting up Part 3. I skimmed over Part 2 because all logic goes straight out the window when the Turtles are actually in the virtual world. Like how you can just make up what happens at will, like Leo teleporting the Sword of Tengu out of Shredder's hands and into his own. It's total nonsense. When put on paper, the flashback of Parts 1 and 2 is pretty simple. But I just have some nitpicks with how it's written, like the aforementioned nonsensical Part 2. But more importantly, in Part 1, the characters feel the need to remind each other like six times that what they're experiencing is a fake virtual projection. I guess this is to make sure the kids are still with us, but it does start getting a little repetitive. 
This brings us into part 3, which is mostly a big action set piece. I want to start with the stuff I'm very entertained by, like how Baxter Stockman is back. He's now a head on a spider body, and the turtles literally think that's a joke. Stockman? <laughs> I almost didn't recognize you. New haircut. I really don't know how they got away with this Stockman plotline. Like, it's so dark. Even if his just being a head doesn't even make sense. Doesn't he need a heart to function? But another thing that I think is funny about this Stockman redesign is that his last body still had a torso and arms. When Stockman showed up and returned to New York, Shredder literally said, Stockman, I'll have your head for this. Well, he got Stockman's head for that. This episode is nuts in the way where I can't even be sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, I'm thoroughly entertained by it, but some of it's just so contrived. I mean, out of nowhere, Donatello asked Professor Honeycutt to use his voice synthesizer to impersonate the Shredder and control Stockman, which I guess he has that now. I feel like that wouldn't be nearly as out of left field if they had set up a voice synthesizer before in one of the Turtles in Space episodes, but as it stands, it feels pretty contrived. Honeycutt uses it to free Stockman from Shredder, and he then seemingly kills Shredder as the foot escape, but since there's still 12 minutes left of the episode to fill, Shredder dropped an Utram implosion device that sets the entire building to detonate in 10 minutes, and then comes back two minutes later and demands the foot go find Stockman. Now, prepare yourself for the incoming mouthful. By this point, the building full of Utrams has been evacuated on the transmat as the turtles activate the device to send the Utrams home while Shredder literally stands there giving a bad guy speech while the Utrams are escaping. After 10 centuries, I will not be denied my revenge. You. But let me back up a minute. Before Shredder comes back, Mortu gives Master Splinter an orb containing all the data the Utrams have on Master Yoshi, who actually was a guardian of the Utrams before the Shredder killed him. This being an important moment, as it shows Yoshi did work for Shredder's enemies, but was so loyal that he never gave up any info, which is why Shredder just killed him. The Utrams also invite Professor Honeycutt to live and work with them on their homeworld, so there's also that. But back to Shredder, he looks so stupid in this episode. I did just play the clip of him monologuing before he runs to catch his enemies that are teleporting away. And he literally gets taken out twice in the same episode. Three times if you count the virtual version. From where I'm sitting, this episode showed Shredder veering too close to the classic series, where his being a goof that gets beat was part of the fun. But he's supposed to be a serious villain in this show, so it's not great. The episode does balance it out by having Shredder still be a tough enemy, but the Turtles are rightfully more on his level than ever before with this being their fourth encounter with him. But obviously, we're ignoring the elephant in the room, the twist reveal. The Shredder really is Chirrell from the flashback. That was not a Shredder ancestor, he was Chirrell pretending to be a human the entire time. Honestly, by the time it happens, I hesitate to call it a twist because the episode is making it pretty damn obvious that Shredder was an Utrom. More importantly, this twist was the moment this show lost a lot of people, particularly old fans, since the show looked as though it was flying off the rails. Like I said, Secret Origins Part 2 and 3 are total madness, but the twist itself isn't one of my issues. This was clearly what they were building up to for the entire first season, as the Sword of Tengu literally has an Utram on the back end of the hilt, as seen as early as the sixth episode. The Utrams were Shredder's secret enemies. He even described them as such in Episode 10. A corrupt and evil force that is out there right now, working its insidious tentacles into every aspect of our world. And Shredder also survived a water tower falling on him and being decapitated. So overall, I dig the buildup and payoff, but a nitpick I do have here is what I'm going to call twist writing. It's where the writers are foreshadowing a plot twist, but they don't want you to know what it is. So therefore, Shredder, when talking with Hunter, whoever, will exclusively refer to the Utrams as his enemies to keep all audience members in the dark throughout season one. However, after this point, he has no problem just calling them the Utrams. In universe, nothing for Shredder changed. There was no reason for him not to call them the Utrams before. It's written that way because the writers are protecting a plot twist. And yes, I'd argue Hun knew Shredder was hunting aliens that lived in New York City. I mean, Hun interrogates Raph in Episode 7 of Season 1 as if he is an alien from another planet to find out if he works for the Utrams. Who do you work for? How long have you been on this planet? What is the level of your technology? Planet? Technology? Boy, you barking up the wrong shell. I'm telling you, these turtles never even heard of your enemies, let alone work for them. More importantly, this twist introduces a very large plot hole into the series. There will be more where that came from, but to start with how the series stands by Season 2, the Guardian showed relief that the Turtles defeated the Shredder and returned to New York, but 
they already know Shredder's a neutron, so it would then follow that they know cutting his head off wouldn't do the job. Again, they were protecting the twist, which has only resulted in this inconsistency. Another plot hole is that the episode makes it clear that Shredder and Mortu haven't seen each other for 1,000 years, but he never stopped calling himself Mortu, since that was his name a thousand years ago. Their search for Splinter Part 1 showed Mr. Mortu in a news article about the research of the TCRI building. So, Shredder never even needed these long operations where guys would go underground and all that because they could just read the news. I guess he never thought of that. While I'm on the subject of plot holes, I always thought it was weird that April's building blew up in the Shredder Strikes Back Part 2 and nobody even looked into what happened there. Like, the police clearly saw a giant ninja bloodbath before the place exploded and April can just rebuild it later in Season 2 without anyone asking questions about it. But you see, little nitpicks like this just don't bother me as much as they used to. Plot holes don't take me out of the experience. I want to make it clear, I like the twist. I love the story of this show, and I appreciate the effort the writers put into the build-up and payoff of this twist. It's just that from a writing execution standpoint, this show is just not as good as Justice League, which treated its audience with a little more respect. Which is saying a lot, because I think this show does that already. The DCAU reused things like explosion effects a lot, but it wasn't whole bits of animation from other episodes reused like in this show, or the episode in question. I mean, look at this shot here. Love that bit, but earlier in the episode they used that same shot. You can tell because they cut away before the shot pans to the implosion device. I'm not trying to be really harsh, because animation is a difficult job, especially with deadlines. Finding ways to reuse footage in non-distracting ways is to be commended, but I can't help but notice it when I've seen the episodes a bunch of times over the years. But anyway, the turtles activate the transmat and get outside to Casey and April while Shredder blows up alongside the building, ending the episode. Like I said, I can watch this episode no problem, but the story too often relied on contrived situations and didn't do a thorough enough job in making sure there weren't little inconsistencies in the continuity of its animation and its story. I tend to not make a big deal out of this when rewatching the show because series that avoid these things deserve extra credit. I'm plenty pleased with the 2003 Turtles show trying to have as much of a story as it does. However, there's just room for improvement, and that really needs to be discussed because Secret Origins lacked in a couple of important areas that I think Season 2 overall fails to improve on as it goes along, which you'll see before the video's over. To let the cat out of the bag, I think Season 1 is a lot better than Season 2. For Season 1, I thought basically every episode was a hit. Big arcs, small episodes, didn't matter. Here in Season 2, I think two of the five big arcs are good. One of them we already discussed. The smaller episodes are good, but then there are three important arcs that just don't work for me. In fact, one of them is even worse than Secret Origins was, but I get ahead of myself. Let's talk about the very next episode after Part 3 of Secret Origins, Episode 9, Reflections. This episode begins with a clickbait stinger at the beginning where we're promised a story of the past coming back to haunt us and showing us a dark reflection of the future. In reality, the episode is just the Turtles, Splinter, April, and Casey at the farmhouse reflecting on the story so far. Yeah, it's a recap episode. Fair enough, the complexity of the story thus far would require a recap if you stopped watching after, say, The Shredder Strikes and came back with an episode as insane as Secret Origins. Going forward with the rest of the show, you just have to know that Shredder is an Utram and he was waging a battle against the rest of his kind and how he and the Turtles came to clash. Donatello remarks that it's actually kind of ironic to look back and think that if Shirelle never forced the Utrams to crash land on the Earth 1,000 years ago, then the Turtles and Splinter would never exist because then the ooze that mutated them, created by the Utrams, would never have touched them in the first place. Despite being a recap, I do always watch this episode when doing a rewatch because there are a lot of good character interactions in this episode, regardless of how pointless it is from a story point of view. On that note, I'd like to discuss a fairly demonized term, filler episodes. A filler episode is one that doesn't add anything to the series' overarching story, but still features the characters on an adventure or whatever. I get that people want all the episodes to be important to the story and not to waste time, but I feel like filler episodes can be enjoyed as stories on their own. The Ace Attorney anime is really good with this, as the new episodes featuring cases not from the games are some of the best. In the 2003 series, there are a pretty decent amount of filler episodes, but what I like about this show is that first, you never know what will be a filler episode in its entirety. I mean, Episode 5 of Season 1, Nano, is about a computer program that has the personality of a child that gets mixed in with a criminal. This episode is worth watching from a story perspective since it's the first time Casey and April meet, but then in Season 2, the Nano episode gets a sequel, and it will get another one later in the series. Some episodes that aren't focusing on the larger story offer things that fill in the gaps, like The King showing the status quo of the Turtles living with April, and was just a good tribute to a comic book legend. 
Episode 12 of Season 1 introduces the Silver Sentry, a real superhero that patrols New York City that Michelangelo meets, creating his alter ego, the Turtle Titan. This shows that superpowers exist in the TMNT mythos, setting up for other heroes to exist in later episodes, like the Justice Force from Episode 22 of Season 2, and the various heroes the Turtles meet throughout the show that later form a new Justice Force. You might think it's kind of weird that full-on superheroes exist in the TMNT mythos, but Mr. Laird put it pretty well. If you can buy into the Turtles and Master Splinter, you can really buy anything that happens. I would never use that as a get-out-of-bad-writing-free card, but he does have a point. The larger point I'm getting at here is that I don't think there is such a thing as a skippable episode of this show, as you never want to miss those character moments, and you don't know what plot lines are going to return and get mixed in with another storyline. We'll see a lot of examples of this going forward, but take notes from the underground, for example. That episode ends with the Turtles promising to return to help the people mutated by the foot, and in Season 2, we get returned to the underground when the Turtles do just that. I bring up filler episodes now because things you might think of as filler take up the middle portion of Season 2. And I think just about all of these are worth watching, like the Golden Puck where the Turtles and Casey stop some goons from stealing the prize of a hockey game. It's a fun episode. Love the part where the group needs to hide from the goons and Casey just hides in the floor with his head under the nightstand. April's artifact is similar to Notes from the Underground in that it starts a story you wouldn't really think gets a conclusion as the Turtles and April travel to some other world that April's uncle got trapped in and have to escape from but it does get a follow-up in a few seasons. Then there's What a Croc, where the Turtles get introduced to a giant croc named Leatherhead. He made a cameo in Secret Origins and reveals that he was found by and worked alongside the Utroms, being mutated by the same ooze as the Turtles, but was left behind when they had to evacuate the building when Shredder attacked. Now he's trying to build a new Transmat in the Turtles' old lair that got destroyed at the beginning of the show, alongside Baxter Stockman, who now has an Utrom exosuit for a body. Stockman briefly turns Leatherhead against the Turtles until he lets it slip that he once worked for the Shredder, who Leatherhead obviously wouldn't like as a former aide of the Utroms. While I'm here, I should mention something I can't unsee, which is this robot Stockman built to fight the Turtles. From a real-world perspective, Clearly, when the design for this thing was created, it was intended for Stockman to have made it for Shredder, but he's dead at this point in the story, so they just make use of the robot design in this episode. However, somebody forgot to remove the foot logo on the side of the machine, which is technically a plot hole, as Leatherhead didn't know Stockman was working for Shredder until he said it, but the robot they built clearly shows Shredder's logo. I know what I just said was a bunch of word salad, but believe me, it makes sense. Leatherhead is presumed dead at the end of the episode, but we can put a pin in that for now. Episode 10, The Ultimate Ninja, is another one that seems like a filler episode that actually introduces us to the story we'll see at the end of the season. A warrior from another dimension has come to battle the Shredder, but since he's dead, he faces Leonardo because he beats Shredder and returned to New York, while the rest of the group can only watch and root for him. This episode sees the animators try integrating real-life footage of water with the animation, and... It doesn't look so convincing, but besides that, this is a good action episode that also begins with the core cast watching a movie and getting ice cream afterwards. I keep appreciating moments like that because the show has seriously earned the ability for its characters to just interact in a non-action context and have me enjoy it just the same. The Ultimate Ninja comes from the dimension of the Battle Nexus led by his father, the Damyo, who seems to know Master Splinter, who is well aware of the rules of engagement the Battle Nexus has. But the episode decides to leave it at that. When the time is right, all will be made clear. So that's my big speech on the smaller episodes in Season 2, but that still leaves three big arcs. City at War, A Rogue in the House, and The Big Brawl. The first two of which I think are pretty underwhelming, especially City at War. The whole idea of City at War is based on one of the Mirage comic arcs, even sharing the same name. Because the Turtles defeated Shredder, the Foot Clan's remaining members, the Purple Dragons, and the Mob are waging war over control of New York City. Leonardo feels responsible for all the suffering caused by the Turf War and wants to get involved, while Raphael doesn't feel an ounce of responsibility and wants the group to get out of the situation, while Don, Mikey, and Casey are along for the ride. I think that premise works pretty well, and this is an important arc for several reasons. Highest among them being the introduction of a new main character, Karai, who leads the Japanese faction of the Foot Clan as she traveled to New York to put an end to the bloodshed. Karai was raised by the Shredder, as she explains to the Turtles that she was an orphan in Japan until Oroku Saki found her and took her in and taught her everything he knew about ninjutsu. He even trusted her enough with his greatest secret, his true identity as a Neutrom. I always thought this dynamic was really interesting. I mean, we don't know why the Shredder took Karai in, let alone trusting her this much. It's not like he needed a loyal follower, because this arc shows he has plenty. People who serve him and him alone even after his death. It's just a rare act of compassion and trust from someone as evil as him. Leo has a lot of faith in Karai, even saying that she's nothing like her father, setting up a lot of drama for later in the series. All this should lead to a good series of episodes, and to be fair, I think a lot of it is good, like Karai's introduction, the fact that it's established that the war is taking lives of innocent people, giving the plot some stakes, 
The voice acting gets pretty intense for the main characters. We see Han muscling back into the Purple Dragons since Shredder's gone, and Stockman bringing his knowledge to the mob, and even they don't like Stockman. But he once again proves himself as so smart that you can't just have him whacked. I'm just very entertained by Baxter Stockman, what can I say? The episode suffers from two major issues. The action that consists of new footage is really good in this episode. Fast-paced, intense, everything you'd want. Especially the fight between Karai's group and the turtles on a rooftop. But part one in particular starts to reuse footage in a way that just takes me out of the experience. Several clips that run for upwards of 10 seconds are blatantly reused from the Shredder Strikes Part 2. Now, reusing Speedlines footage is something I'd noticed, but is not a big deal. This is what Secret Origins Part 3 did. And something the Shredder Strikes Back Part 2 did. But when it's just straight up footage from a completely different episode, it just bugs me. As established, I don't know what timeline the animators were on making this, but something I wanted to point out. The biggest issue I have with this episode, and the thing I remember the most about it, is the numerous arguments between Leo and Raph over whether or not they should even be in the war at all. Leo says they should, Raph says they shouldn't, Leo says they're to blame for the war's existence, Raph says they aren't, Leo says he's a hothead who should go home, some action set piece interrupts them until like the third time where Raph finally does go home and returns the end of part three exactly how you'd expect. It just gets really repetitive to see the same debate play out over and over when there really isn't that much in the way of an interesting conversation to be had about this. The way the story is written, Raph's in the wrong, so repeating the same thing over and over just gets annoying. But to cover how the episode ends, Karai comes up with this terrible plan where she'll pretend to be Shredder and announce that the war is over, and if it doesn't work, the turtles will jump in to back her up. This plan goes about as well as you'd expect. By the end, the mob and Purple Dragon resistance is beaten badly enough to where the fighting will cease as Karai promises to the turtles that the foot will never go after them again, leading to the end of the episode where we see the biggest ass pull in history. The biocytes have almost finished healing my flesh. Soon, we will destroy the turtles. <laughs> They needed Shredder to come back for the series to proceed, but I don't know why they even killed him at the start of the season anyway. I mean, you could argue it was needed for the gang war to happen, but I don't even agree with that. Go back to Season 1, Episode 24, Lone Wrath and Cub. The very next episode after Return to New York Part 3. That filler episode introduces the audience to the mob as we get this line. There's a gang war coming now that the Shredder's out of the picture, and nothing's gonna stand in my way. That as confirmed in the behind the scenes, was a direct setup to the City at War arc. The crime bosses in NYC assumed Shredder was dead following return to New York, but he obviously wasn't when he came out of hiding to kill the Utrams in Secret Origins. But I guess no one knew about that. I mean, the Ultimate Ninja battled Leo over his beating Shredder in Season 1, not what just happened two episodes prior. In alternative ideas, to just have Shredder's fate seem a little less sealed at the end of Secret Origins, and establish at the end of City at War that he was just in hiding after losing everything at the end of Secret Origins, and Karai just acted of her own free will in his absence, but now he's back. I just feel like they needed Shredder back for Secret Origins, but then needed him to go back to being gone so they could do this series of episodes. But they needed him to be back for the rest of the series' of story to proceed as planned. It's a very sloppy sequence of events, and Shredder's losing a lot of credibility as a villain because of it. I'd say Shredder coming back from being vaporized without explanation is one of the worst bits of storytelling in the entire show that also leaves a big stain on City at War. But like it or not, he's back, and he's ready for action in A Rogue in the House Part 1 and 2. Going into this episode, you just kind of have to pretend Shredder's being back isn't nonsense and roll with it, because if you do, this episode has some pretty good highs. Such as establishing that Hun takes issue with Karai because he knows Shredder values her more than him when he thinks he should be Shredder's number one guy, or how Stockman's back under the employment of the foot and is now a brain in a jar with a single eyeball. Seriously though, how does he even function like that? All I can say is, is this dynamic still gets me. Shredder literally said, You should have quit while you were ahead. <laughs> Go ahead and laugh, Shredder. And he laughed about it. It's just so ridiculous. I love it. The plot of this episode is that the Foot have developed some super powerful robots, one of them being based on Splinter as they send it to kill the turtles. But little do they know, the turtles have a new ally as they find the Triceraton that escaped the TCRI building at the start of the season as the oxygen atmosphere of Earth is messing with his brain. To the point where he thinks the turtles are his fellow Triceratons as he tears the Splinter bot to pieces and joins the turtles in the counterattack against the Foot's tanker facility, sacrificing himself at the end to save the turtles. In this episode, we see that Karai cares about Shredder, but the respect is not a two way street. This being more of that drama maxing I was talking about earlier. Karai, you must learn that your duty to me is far more important than your honor. I. I understand, Master. We shall see, Karai, for you will be the one to slay the turtles. 
That obviously isn't going to happen, but it creates drama between characters as Karai wants to be as honorable as Leonardo is, but as he says, as long as she serves Shredder without question, that can't happen. This is a pretty good episode overall, especially in the action department, however, Shredder's role in it all just leaves me feeling mixed. On the positive side, his relationship with Karai adds conflict to the story that wasn't there before, also including some mystery to the story too. Like we see here that he treats Karai just as poorly as everybody else, but that brings you back to the same question. Why did he take her in when she was a kid in the first place? Maybe Karai is not a reliable narrator for what actually happened, but we clearly see that she knows he's an Utrom, something even Hun doesn't know, somehow. So he trusts her, but maybe that's because he knows she's the most loyal person in his ranks? I don't know. Then, like I said, there's the drama between Karai and Hun over who's the second in command of the foot. All that being new drama introduced because of Karai. However, for the heroes, there's just something so played out about Shredder fighting the turtles at this point. In regards to Shredder as a villain, he really is just a mustache twirler by this episode. Without his hunting the Utrams, there really isn't anything left for him to do besides fight the turtles, and that's just kind of lame because he's going to have to lose every time he tries. I think that's why he never even fights them directly in this one. The writers know another defeat would make him look a lot less like Shredder and more like, well, this guy. I'll do it again and again. I will make X and Zero mine. Now come and get me. Give me a good fight like you always do. Instead, he briefly battles Splinter, but mostly the Triceraton, at least being something we haven't seen before. That being the sacrifice I mentioned earlier in the episode as the turtles get away as the ship explodes. I think the writers realized Shredder was losing a lot of steam as a villain here, compared to how great he was in Season 1, so after his defeat in this episode and rescue at the hands of Karai, we don't see him again for a while. At least, that's my reading on it. Oh, and of course, I have to highlight the ending of this one. Aha! Once again, Baxter Stockman has cheated death. <laughs> a Rogue in the House is a difficult episode for me to talk about because I don't have as solid an opinion on it like I do City at War. I think this episode is better than that one and has a lot going for it when it comes to story and action. I think it really is just that Shredder's revival at the end of City at War leaves a really bad taste in my mouth going into this episode, even if the episode is doing its best. The show just had a Shredder problem. They sacrificed a lot of logic to bring him back, but they thought it was worth it because of the added Karai drama. And of course, having seen Season 3, I know it was worth it because they fixed the problem Shredder had in this episode, which is that his only goal is fight turtles. One he can't possibly succeed at. But as for how Season 2 stands, irrespective of Season 3, I have to call out what I'm seeing here. But of course, the season isn't over yet. There's still the last four episodes, the big brawl. And since this video is ballooning in length, let's get this one over with. This finale is the payoff from episode 10 as the turtles follow Splinter to the Battle Nexus dimension. This being a gathering of the greatest warriors in the universe as they battle to see who's the best. Splinter having won the previous tournament against a vile villain, Draco, who's back to get revenge on Splinter alongside the Damio's son who wants revenge on Leonardo for his humiliation from earlier in the season. They're working together to kill the Damio, take control of his magical war staff, and then kill the turtles. The setup of the episode is obviously geared around producing as much action as possible, and they do a great job keeping the set pieces really entertaining, as we see characters who don't even have names battling it out in the tournament, and the fluid animation manages to make it entertaining, while leaving room for continuity, such as Traximus from the Triceraton homeworld being in the competition. He tells Raph that the turtles capturing the Prime Leader in Episode 5 allowed the other gladiators to escape the games, and now he's here meeting the best warriors in the universe to build a resistance to the Prime Leader. We also learn that Master Yoshi was a winner of the Battle Nexus in the past. And so was the Shredder. Great world building all around. This episode introduces a new character, Miyamoto Usagi and his friend Gen the Rhino. Usagi is a rabbit warrior from another dimension that befriends Leonardo and his family. Usagi himself starred in an entirely different comic series that launched around the same time as when the Mirage Turtle book started, and these two brands have collaborated in the comics, and Usagi has appeared in the first three TMNT cartoons as a nod to that history. The highlight of this episode for me, being when Draco sends a squad of assassins to kill the Damio as Usagi, Donatello, and Leonardo fend them off. Seriously, you'd think ninja action would get a little old after this four-part episode, but the pacing is really good in this. First, you get the suspense of the tournament itself as Mikey gets closer and closer to winning with some good moments in there, like when Splinter ends up against Mikey and he just lets his son win so he can progress further. Or when Raph specifically gets out of the competition at the hands of Mikey. The episode marvelously positions characters where they need to be for the story to progress, like Donatello getting out first so that he can be there with Usagi when they're fighting the assassins, or Raph getting out and teaming up with Traximus to rescue Splinter when he gets blamed for attacking the Damio. 
In the finale, Draco steals the War Staff, but it goes out of control and creates a portal as he and the Ultimate Ninja fall inside the portal, meaning that Damiona has to grieve the loss of his son. But on a more lighthearted note, Mikey actually wins the Battle Nexus on a pure technicality. The episode ends with a cliffhanger for Season 3 as the Triceratons have tracked Professor Honeycutt to Earth and plan to invade, ending Season 2. All in all, I quite like the last episode. It's my favorite arc in the season, paying off big time on the promises of an all-out action series of episodes. But on the whole, how do I feel about Season 2? By this point in the video, you'd know I'm just not as crazy about it as I was the previous one. Season 1 is something I can go back to with ease because it starts simple and gradually expands the scope and stakes in a really natural way. Season 1 holds up really well, but Season 2 is just a little messy. Thing is, I think Season 2 is just underwhelming by comparison. In this roster, there aren't any episodes I dislike. All of them are entertaining, and I don't mean in an ironic sense because they're all far above watchable. And of the 26 episodes, I'd say I think 19 of them are good, or even great episodes. Especially the smaller scale ones that I didn't spend as much time on. The episodes I don't like as much, Secret Origins and City at War aren't terrible either, I just think they have some really large issues that I think a show focused on story deserves to be criticized for. Especially because the ideas aren't rotten to the core or anything, I just think they rely too heavily on exposition and contrived situations that leave a bad taste in your mouth. Season 2 is not bad, I just had to spend most of this video on the things Season 2 does that leave it far below Season 1 in my eyes, which was a perfect 10 out of 10. I'd give Season 2 a 7.5 out of 10. It's pretty good overall, but a big step down from Season 1. It's far from irredeemable though, and sets up a lot of interesting stories to come. I just think the ambitious nature of this story that has a lot of backstory and world building and continuity just left Season 2 with big issues like contrivances and plot holes, and for the standards of Season 1, that's pretty disappointing. However, for the next video, we're talking about Season 3, something I'm very excited about to say the least. But that's all the time we have for today. I thank everyone for watching, and I hope to see you next time. As always, I'd like to thank the patrons who make this video possible. The Tier 2 patrons are getting their names displayed on the screen right now, and the Tier 3 patrons pay extra to get their names read out loud. Those being... Caleb Escobar, Chris Delgado, Hazel Zero, Aaron the Atom, Peregree, The Squeaker Nerd, Protector of Memes, Daxtry A. Velencourt, Jepson 2.0, Keiko Blur, Kyler Lehman, Bo Blocks, Joe, Michael Caboose, Ya Boy Joe, Avatar Aiden YT, Icarus 10032, 8-Bit Bio, Myopa Game, J. Saya Joe Star, Lightning Angel Seda, Quentin is Clones, Shun Goku Zero, and Adonius Smith. Thanks again.